All right, let's start with chapter two, the falsifiability criterion. Okay, let's get in into this. All right, first off, let's begin with the different ways that we have for acquiring knowledge. Now, this is sort of a philosophical discussion. Um, how do humans come to know things? Well, one way that we come to know things is through the method of authority. This is where we rely on a trusted source to provide us with valid and reliable information. You're kind of doing that right now as you're listening to me talk and assuming that I'm telling you true things, telling you things that are, are accurate. Um, this is a great way of conveying information from one generation to the next, right? When we were little, we got almost all of our information from elders, trusted authorities, parents, teachers, so on. Um, you know, back in uh, human history, almost all information was acquired through authorities where, um, you know, people couldn't read yet, so they had to rely on authorities to read stuff to them, or people who were entrusted with sort of like the group's memories, the historian for the group would be the one who would tell the stories and, and pass them on to the next generation. So, I mean, it's, got, it's a, got a long history of us being able to trust other people to convey information to us. Somebody who knows something that we don't know. We do it today when we'd want to know what the weather's going to be like. I mean, we could definitely look out the window. Everybody always jokes about, well, just look out the window if you want to know what the weather is. Well, that's great advice, except for, uh, you know, the weather can change across the day, right? So you look out the window, it's sunny right now. So you head out and then it starts to rain four or five hours later and you're stuck outside without your proper, you know, rain gear. Um, when you get on the internet or you look at the weather person on TV, they have um, additional information that you don't have access to. They have radars, they have you know models, they have all sorts of things that they can rely on. And so yeah, we trust people who we think have access to information that we don't have, and that's an authority. Okay, so that's a great way to acquire knowledge. But of course, sometimes the authority is wrong. How often have you trusted a, an authority to tell you about the weather and they were incorrect? Um, so sometimes they're just outright wrong and sometimes they're trying to trick us. Sometimes they're telling us things that aren't true. Um, I know I tricked my kids when they were little and I told them there was a Santa Claus. It was fun. We all enjoyed it. But guess what? There was no, I'm sorry if you did not know this, but there is no Santa. Um, and they kind of, you know, it's kind of a betrayal when you figure out that there's no Santa and your parents have been telling you that, right? Um, sometimes authorities tell us things that aren't true. Uh, sometimes they do it for bad reasons. Sometimes they're trying deliberately to trick us because they want us to go along with something, that they want us to keep a secret, so they don't want to tell us the truth. There's all sorts of reasons why an authority may tell the, the wrong information. So how about um, if we just believe things that we've always known? Like, if I've always known it, it must be true. That's called the method of tenacity. How can it be wrong? I've always known it. So the example I, I have for that is a lot of people still believe that if you crack your knuckles, you'll cause arthritis. When my kids got to adolescence, they started, both of them, one after the other, as soon as they started puberty, they started cracking their knuckles. And apparently my husband does not appreciate the sound of knuckles cracking. I did not know this about him <laughs> until the kids started cracking their knuckles. And he would tell them, oh, well, told, told my daughter because she, she, reach puberty first, right? So he's like, stop it, you're going to hurt your knuckles. So I pulled up all this literature to show him that it doesn't hurt your knuckles to crack your knuckles. It's, it's harmless, it's fine, it's just releasing some gas from the synovial fluid and it's no big deal. Well that's when I discovered he didn't really care about the truth or falseness of what he was saying. It's just he's always believed it. It's got to be true. He's always, in fact, he got it from a trusted source, his mom. So this is why we call those kinds of things old wives' tales, isn't it? Because we oftentimes hear them from our mom, who in our perspective is an old wife. An old wife. Um, so when I tried to tell him that his perception was incorrect, he refused to look at it. He goes, I, I don't believe it. I don't believe this data. I think that it's harmful to crack your knuckles. He just refused to accept the possibility that he knew something that was inaccurate. Um, that's the method of tenacity. I cling to what I've always known and I refuse to accept something new. Now, this sounds like a way better idea. What if we just trust our senses? Use the method of experience. Um, enlightened philosophers suggested that we should exclusively rely on the method of experience. So trust our own senses. Well, that's a great idea, 
except for there are a couple of problems with our own senses. One is that sometimes our senses fool us. Sometimes we hear things that aren't accurate. We, uh, we sometimes see things that aren't accurate. Um, we draw wrong conclusions from the information coming in from our senses. My favorite ex example of this, I, I'm, the, I'm the butt of this joke, unfortunately, but um, my mom and I were at Morro Bay, and for some reason my brother and my dad had gone off to do something else, and we were on vacation. And so mom and I are on this bluff overlooking the, the bay, and we're like, oh, I see otters. Oh my gosh, we wanted to see otters so badly. So we sat on the top of that bluff for probably three hours, just transfixed by these otters that we were watching. And we were nudging each other going, wow, look, that one just dove down. Oh, that one has a baby on its chest. Oh, they look like they're eating. You know, we were just having a ball. And then my brother and my dad come back and they've got binoculars with them. And they train the binoculars on our little group of uh, otters and come to find out that there were no otters in that whole scene. Apparently what we'd been watching was the the air balls that are in kelp that allow the kelp to stay at the surface. <laughs> and as the waves were coming in and out, it was causing those air balls to sometimes be under the water, sometimes be above it, sometimes there'd be leaves on the top of the water that sort of look like, I guess, to us otters. Oh my gosh, they ruined our entire vacation because we had had the greatest time with these otters. And then to find out we had been watching sea kelp the entire time. It was a completely non-animate object and we just had such a ball. I mean, I saw babies and everything. It was the greatest thing until my brother and my dad ruined it by telling us the truth, right? From that time on, of course, we were teased about being terrible witnesses really and for a while there every gift I got was in the form of some kind of sea otter related thing but it really drove home the idea that I can't even trust my own eyes I mean I 100 percent believed I saw otters up until through the binoculars I had to admit those are not otters um, I came to the conclusion there's got to be something better than my own senses for understanding the world now let's use an example that you might have experienced. A lot of times when we look around our own high school, it seems like there's a lot of girls who are pregnant and that this is becoming like an epidemic of teenage girls being pregnant. When we know people who are experiencing something, it makes it seem like it's more common. And that's another shortcoming of the method of experience, that we have a narrow range of people who we know. We have a narrow range of experience. And so we may get a skewed impression of how common something is or how likely something is, um, how big of a problem something is, because we have this little narrow view of the world. We all like to think we are good observers and we're seeing all sorts of variations in behavior. But the truth is, we have a narrow range of, of experience. And so yeah, we may look around and say, wow, five of my friends got pregnant or, or two girls at my school were pregnant or something and we may come to the conclusion that it's really common. Um, but if we rely on the scientific method, which is the most reliable way to understand the world, we're going to go ahead and collect some data and test hypotheses. And what we're going to find is that actually the teen pregnancy rate and the teen birth rate and the teen abortion rate, they're all down. All of these things are significantly down. For the first time since 1935, these rates have gone down. So science shows us that our own personal experience may be incorrect. Um, now, what makes science different from the method of experience is that instead of just looking around at who we can see and, and focusing in on the things that attract our attention, which is another shortcoming of experience, we only notice those things that attract our attention. In the scientific method, we make a prediction in a, ahead of time. We say, this is what I'm going to look for. And then I see whether the data out in the world actually supports my prediction, whether what I find is actually what I thought I would find. That's the beauty of science. We make the prediction ahead of time and then we collect the data and see if the data supports the prediction. So back to my synovial fluid knuckle cracking example. The thing about the knuckle cracking is that when we collect data across time, we find that there is no higher rate of arthritis among people who cracked their knuckles when they were young than there is among people who didn't crack their knuckles when they were young. So we can toss out the method of authority or the method of of um, tenacity. We can ignore, maybe 
in my personal experience, I cracked my knuckles when I was young, and now my knuckles hurt because I've got osteoarthritis. I could toss that out. I can say, you know what, on average, the data does not support that interpretation. The data supports the, the interpretation that knuckle cracking is harmless. So that's what we're going to rely on, is the scientific method. We're going to try not to focus on authority, tenacity, or experience. We're going to use the scientific method. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a little break here, and we'll come back in the next lecture and talk about steps in the scientific method.